Dearly beloved, <clears throat> we are grateful to the Lord for yet another session. We are on the 15th session of uh, on discussion on intercession. <laughs> and uh, worshipping God as a lifestyle number seven. Mm -hmm. Last week we were looking at the tokens of worship. Earlier on, we had discussed of why of worship, of worship, and we said God said He has created us, He has made us, formed us, given us a name, and He has married us. We are fiance to Him. He's paid our bride price with the blood of Jesus, going beyond mere children, right? An amazing relationship. And for that, he deserves to be worshipped. <laughs> then we looked at the how of worship in spirit and in truth. So the why, the how, the heart behind the worship. Romans 12, 1 and 2. The hands of worship, you know, perhaps that's what we are looking at, the tokens, or the accoutrements, <laughs> the tools, what we need to use to accompany true worship. Hallelujah. Last week we looked at... A very interesting scripture the Lord gave me, Second Chronicles chapter 29. And boy, we're able to handle just the first four verses. And in these four verses, we got to know that before any true worship could take place, when Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, ascended the throne, he had to first open the temple. And that was a long conversation that I didn't know about. You know, a few bits and pieces here, you know, um, knowledge about few and pieces, but the way the Lord put them together uh, was quite interesting. Today, I want to continue with that same discussion on Second Chronicles chapter 29. Remember, I was pleading with you to go and study it and if you did and i'm sure you yourself you found a lot of the tools or tokens of worship before we continue i think it's just all right <laughs> to go back to the one who is going to have the discussion with us our lord himself dear holy spirit and commit this session into their hands right shall we pray so father we come before your throne of grace just as we are we come through the blood that has made a new and a living way for us. The blood with which we cannot dare imagine to approach your fiery throne. So we come through the blood because we have sent in our thoughts, in our words, in our imaginations, in our actions. Even when we claim to sit silent idle, somehow be sent <laughs> and we are asking that your blood wash and cleanse us we we agree with everything you call sin that we have committed let your blood speak for us this morning in the name of jesus we are sitting at your feet once again asking that your word will come to us in sweet summits Yes, we want a sonnet, a ballad, a dance, something that will bring so much relief to us. Because we have so many questions. Answer us to the power of your word. In the name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are reading King Hezekiah's reforms. And as I began to read, you know, in the preparation, there was one question I was asking the Lord. What are you going to bring us this kind of leadership in Africa? That we are looking at a king who was so totally dedicated to God. Because the trend now is back in my home, they will say half stone, half iron, or both father, dear father. We are depending on God, going to the church as leaders to give him thanks, thanks offering service for winning elections. And yet before the elections, we have scouted the land and go be, gone beyond to look for powers. Because God is too slow. And he might not give it to us because we don't deserve it to be leaders. We've shed the blood of the very people we are coming to rule. We've gone through all kinds of atrocious rituals. And throughout the rest of our lives, we are living our posterity with blood, guilt. <laughs> and they are going to pay for it. The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. <laughs> Family baggages, all in the name of power. Church, as we look at revival and as we cry for revival, let's not forget that a lot has to do with Political leadership also. Mm. If we call for, for it, it will happen. If we cry for it. I believe from time to time, the Lord gave Israel respite by bringing on kings like Ezekiah because there were few, a few who could not stand the appalling situation of idolatry. And they cried out. God will always leave himself a remnant. Let's not forget that political leadership has a lot of role, a big role to play in true revival. <laughs> Let our prayers touch them. That one king, that one president, that one prime minister who will believe that God alone is sufficient. To withstand the powers of witches and wizards and necromancers and wicked men in our lands and nations. That it is God who sets up kings <laughs> and put down kings. We could, but ask the leaders themselves whether they believe God set them up for all they are paid to be where they are. They are still paying homage to other deities after coming to church. God, they have to. When? Oh, when, Lord. Give us leaders after your hearts. So let's see how Hezekiah went about these reforms. And as I began to, you know, I mean, just look at that scripture again. God's word is something else. Hezekiah began with the Levites and the priesthood. And there was something, some instructions that he gave to them that are so, 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 so pertinent. I mean, important to our discussion. You know, the other time I was just sitting down and said, Lord, is this sheer arrogance talking about the priesthood all the time? But I think today there's some good news, some good instructions that 
you know, our pastors, our most spiritual leaders. You know, and I, I want to just isolate the fact that God still has a remnant. And people who have understood these principles already. Leaders, spiritual leaders who have understood these principles already and are living by the dictates of the Almighty God. There are a few. There are 7,000 years at that point. Bow to pay. There's always a remnant. So please don't get offended if you are already being, you know, walking in the shadow of the Almighty. Hezekiah directed his attention to the Levites and the priesthood first and foremost because without them there will be no worship. The Lord has chosen them. We will see, we will hear him saying certain things about the fact that God has chosen the priesthood and, and put, as it were, assigned them the role of leading true worship. And nobody can do it for them. Anybody who tries to stand in their place, as it were, to perform that task is calling for trouble. They have a peculiar role. Today we may call ourselves you know, the, the priesthood of the believers. Believers, yes, it is. We are all priests. But some are called pastors. Chosen to be pastors. Apostles. Prophets. Teachers. Evangelists. The fivefold ministry is crying out for proper performance. Because without that, People will still be swayed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So let's hear what Hezekiah was telling the priesthood. Essential to our cry for revival. He said, listen to me. Levites, listen to me. And later on, you find, you know, them saying that it was the way, according to the word of God. So here is Hezekiah, as it were, standing in the place of God, giving this instruction. He was not just doing it because Parliament has met and taken a decision, but he had opened himself up for the Holy Spirit to speak through him on behalf of the Lord, God Himself. We we'll read it as we move on. <coughs> Excuse me. So he said, now consecrate yourselves, dedicate yourselves. So first and foremost, you yourself must be dedicated. For every proper worship, there must be a dedication of self. Dedicate yourself. Renew your covenant with the Lord as priests. Number two. Consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers. Yet last week we saw how he said the house had been shut. <coughs> and if the house has been shut, then definitely no proper worship is going on there. So he said, go and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers. As you consecrate the house of the Lord, there's something you need to do. Get the filth of idol worship out of the holy place. It's calling for a complete paradigm shift. Some things will have to shift. We are not going to do business as usual. Some programs must be, through, must be thrown out. Some policies must be debunked. <laughs> some structures must fall. In fact, some people must lose their positions. People who are bringing filth into the temple, into the house of the Lord must be replaced. And I know your mind is scanning around. The untouchables 
in the congregation who are polluting the sanctuary must be shown the exit. Yes, if you really want proper reforms, there should be no mercy because God has given them enough time to change their minds. And if they want, they won't. They must be deposed from the chairs in which they sit, from which they offer wicked counsel. Excuse me. <coughs> I believe you know what I'm talking about. Some deacons and deaconesses and elders and uh, whatever the names we call them. Some choristers and choir masters and some musicians, especially the highlands. Yes, back home, we had the musicians. They have no idea about the difference between God and Adam. Except that maybe at creation they were both in the Garden of Eden. And yet we hired them to come and play for us, for worship. Sometimes they booked quite a number of such activities. I wouldn't even call it worship, they are activities. So before it's time for what they call it, um, altar call, you need them to play. They are going to the next church to play and collect money. Hey, worship for sale. If we really are looking for proper worship, this practice must stop. I believe God would be very happy if we just go to church to clap our hands with no musicians, but true worshippers clapping their hands will make a better music than the drumming and the loud instruments by people who are defiled. We are looking at revival, right? Maybe you are saying, oh, but we are inviting them to come and listen to the word. Some of them will not even stay during the time of uh, the, the sermon. They will not be there. They are going to the next church. But they've been booked <laughs> to offer their services in the name of worship. When we have all the teenagers and the children running around who can't be trained, and for a long time, dedicate themselves to ministry in the church. We always want what is already cooked. Discipleship is too expensive. It will be part of the worship. Discipleship, uh, I mean, mentoring and discipleship, you know, training. To train these little ones to take over and minister in the house of God. So Hezekiah gave three commands to the Levites. Consecrate yourself. The priesthood, the Lord is asking for proper consecration. You know yourself. When you have pastors who can say, we don't even have our devotion. We don't have our quiet time. We don't have it with our families either. So just get up. I'm supposed to be preaching today. Just go to the Bible, go to the commentaries, put something down. No wonder they can stand in the pulpit and say the title of my message. Because it is, yes, they are prepared. Lesson notes and delivering. In all humility. Then consecrate the house of God. Get rid of idol worship out of the holy place. Getting rid of idol worship will also mean we are basing ourselves, humbling ourselves and, you know, cutting off the idols that we have made of ourselves as priesthood. In some churches, pastors are literally worshipped 
I mean, you talk about, oh, as for these churches, they, they don't belong to God. Forget about those churches. We are talking about what we call church. We are charismatics. We are evangelicals. We are this, we are that. The way we adore our worship, our pastors. There's a difference between respect and adoration. Adoration belongs to God alone. All men can be respected and honored. But when it comes to adoration, it is God alone. Pastor, if you are listening to me in all humility, let the Holy Spirit convict you. If you think your church has put you on a pedestal, it is time for you to come down from that pedestal. Humble yourself before the Lord has said and tell him all glory belongs to you. Because, you see, if you don't get the filth of your position as an idol, you don't get it out and take it out of the way, God will take you out. I promise you, he will take you out. In all humility. Then Hezekiah went on to, you know, enumerate the, the sins of the fathers that had brought so much trouble on Israel, on Judah. Now, Hezekiah recounts the sins of the fathers after instructing the Levites. And he says, our fathers have been unfaithful. They have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have abandoned him. They have turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord. And have turned their backs toward him. They have also closed the doors of the temple porch. And put out the lamps. Hmm. And they have burned incense. They have not burned incense. That's prayer. Nor offered burnt offerings in the place, in the holy place to the God of Israel. Talk about all the offerings. Now that we are collecting all the offerings, the Lord is saying we have not paid any offerings. We are collecting all the tithes and offerings because uh, <laughs> the heart behind the offerings makes it acceptable all otherwise. I was just looking at these nine issues. And you might be saying, well, he was talking about the nation... <laughs> Today, that nation could be called a church. It's talking about the church yesterday, the church today, the church tomorrow. So that fathers in the church have not been faithful. You don't have to scan your mind too far. We look at all the big, huge buildings across the nations, you know, especially in the Western world. They used to be very full of worshippers. Where are they? And as we intimated last week, some of those churches are closed. Some have been turned into mocks. Some have been turned into marketplaces. Some have been turned into houses. Some have been turned into warehouses. Because the fathers were unfaithful. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. This is when all the lodges, you know, the church leadership were so much involved with the lodge and church members were involved with the lodge and all kinds of wicked acts were taking place. They abandoned him. His worship was still going on. But God is saying, they abandoned me. They turned their faces from the dwelling place and they turned their backs towards me. They closed the doors of the temple. They put out the lamps. What are the lamps? The testimony 
of Christ was put out. And they have not burned incense. <laughs> you know, they have not been incense, but they have not prayed. Because incense here perhaps you know, was referring more to prayer, effective prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. And when we look at the type of praying that has been taking place, the new forms of praying, <coughs> where we clap our hands and kill all our enemies. It is all about vengeance. All about vengeance. All about vengeance. Is the Lord saying, I don't call that prayer? We are praying, you know. <laughs> this is if you want your church members to pray, you have to bring a prophet. Because if you call for a prayer meeting, raw prayer meeting to just come and pray for the church, come and pray for the nation, they won't come. If you ask, tell them that the prophet is coming, they will come. And be spectators. Not much prayer has been of it. And also when we are claiming to pray with all our sins, Hanging on our shoulders. It says, A prayer of a, of an unrighteous man is an abomination unto him. Hmm. They have not offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. I said, Ah, but we are paying our tithes and our offerings. And we are being called, told that when we pay our tithes and offerings, God will be happy. Even when a pastor is preaching, you can just interrupt to go and put money on the altar. We are calling for money. And without money, I mean, when I look at the appeals, how pastors are making time to appeal for money, it's as if we, we are working. This is a, We are working for you and we need to be paid. And I keep asking myself, go, so you can't provide for your services. You can't provide for your work. You want us to be beggars like this. Is that the only way your work can be done? to tell all kinds of stories, to get people to give you money. <coughs> and God is saying here, they have not offered bent offense. I haven't seen it. The ties, the big ties and the big offense, they didn't come to me. I haven't seen them. The money that is gained at any cost, from laundering to whatsoever, prostitution, double money, whatever. I'm not seeing it. <laughs> no wonder we finish paying our tithes and the blessings the Lord has, has prepared for tithe givers. How many of us can really testify that we are enjoying it? A good measure, shaking together, pressed down, running over, open the windows of heaven and pour on us a blessing such as we cannot contain. The last time the heavens were open, the whole earth got inundated. Hmm. Where is our, 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 our tithes and offerings going? If they are not rich in God. He says, you haven't offered burnt offerings to me. And I think we have dealt with the situation where he tells us, go away with your sons. Go away with your offerings. I'm not even looking at them. And God says, therefore the wrath, you know, Hezekiah was telling them, therefore the wrath of the Lord has been against Judah and Jerusalem. And he has made them an object of horror, of terror, of horror, and of his sin. Just as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword. And our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity. Because of this. When you have a nation coming to take over your nation, polluting all your water bodies, <coughs> so you can't even get water to drink. And government is paying lip service to 
turn it inside around. Because some, for many, their hands are equally soiled. A nation coming to take over all your assets <laughs> because you have borrowed money from them and there is nothing to show for even the nationals to see that this is what the money was used for, for which we are suffering. Is that not a captivity? <laughs> we are blaming COVID for every financial difficulty in our nations. But irresponsible governance has had a lot to do with our situation. And it has been the result of a closed church. Because I believe that there is a, a distinct, you know, um, relationship or correlation between the state of the church and the state of the nation. When the church acts right, the nation goes right. <laughs> Hallelujah. It says, yes, God has made us an object of terror, of horror, and of hissing. Terror, horror, hissing. Just as you see with your own eyes. Are you seeing stuff that are tackling your palate? I see stuff that calls for weeping. Our fathers have fallen by the sword. And our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity because of this. Captivity to every kind of immorality. In our nation, Ghana, you know, things that we didn't used to talk about are in the open. Are in the open. Is this not captivity? What is it? Give me another name for it. Can Ezekiah spell out what must be done? I believe the Lord has just given us, you know, looking at this scripture, said, Lord, you are showing us what to do to restore your glory. To restore your mercy. God gives mercy. But there are conditions. What is to be done? King Ezekiel said, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant. That is a solemn agreement with the Lord God of Israel. So that his burning anger would turn away from us. There's something we'll have to do to turn God's burning anger from us. And he's a, he's a guy who calls it a solemn agreement. Mutual agreements. God is ready to dole out his mercies and his blessings. But we must play our part. So he says, my sons, do, do not be negligent and careless now. For the Lord has chosen you. This is where I was talking about the parts of the priesthood. The portion of the priesthood. In this new life we are looking for. What has the Lord chosen you for? To stand in his presence. To attend to his service. And to be his ministers and burn incense. You're going to stand in his presence. You're going to attend to his service. You're going to be his ministers and then you will burn incense. I want to just go over this instruction to the priesthood again. <laughs> stand in his presence. And you know, it takes a lot of holiness. Because without holiness, you cannot see God. To be able to stand in his presence. 
and that is where we are so already remember we we've you know um alluded to Zechariah chapter three, the changing of the garment of the priests, the few the garment that now brought the priests into the course of the Lord, and hence the cry for consecration of the priesthood. So that you'll be able to stand in his presence. You see, we are tired of hearing men's message. We want to hear that says the Lord. And we can only say that says the Lord when we are standing in the presence of the Lord to hear his voice directly. And that is what we are calling the priesthood to do for us. Stand in his presence. Attend to his service. Okay. Today what we can hear pastor say, it is my church. This is what I do here. If you don't like it, go. That time I was, I was chatting with, with a friend and I said, it's like we are the landlords of the buildings, the church buildings, and we invite God. If our God is a tenant, if we don't like him, we can give him the rejection. No, the reject notes and ask him to move out. In fact, <laughs> it doesn't have to be. I mean, by our actions, we've already given him the notice to move. And for some places, he's already gone. But the Lord is calling the priesthood back to say, stand in my presence, attend to my service. That church building we put up there. Let me be the landlord. And you just come in to lead the service for me. And I'll pay you your wages. Be my ministers. <laughs> ministers will bring me the oblation, the sacrifices and everything. Be my ministers. Stand between the people and myself, as it were, to help them bring acceptable offering unto me. Hence, the meter on the forehead, holiness unto the Lord, so that by being ministers, you'll be able to consecrate the offerings on the altar and make them acceptable before me. It calls for commitment. It calls for holiness. It calls for a good relationship between us and our boss who is now God. Then burn incense. Pray. <laughs> Communicate effectively with me. Pray on behalf of the people. Pray on behalf of your family. Pray on behalf of the nations. Pray, burn incense, pray, bring me acceptable prayer. We're talking about the continual relief, you know, communication between the pastor or the church leader and God. Because you see, in this communication, that is when we get to know God's mind. And it's over trivial things and over big things. Last night, the Lord said, I will wake you up early. And after you've finished whatever you're doing, at four o'clock, you have your broadcast. You record your broadcast. And at 1 a.m., because when I took my phone, it was 1.02 a.m. I was going to, I got on my knees. I said, well, I, I gave you the agenda yesterday night, right? So get up and do what you're supposed to be doing. So I'm working on this material. 
And exactly at 4 a.m., exactly at 4 a.m., I finished the entire work. I mean, the work up to the point where I needed to stop. I, I couldn't help but lift up my hands and said, how did you know that I will finish this work at 4 a.m.? Look, look at me asking God how you knew. <laughs> 4 a.m. And then, you know, the, even the place to do the broadcast and all, everything now just began to shift. People began to shift position to just give me clearance. Because God has spoken. Somebody said, if I have wings, I'll fly. Another person said, oh, if God bids you fly, he will give you the wings. I'm talking about the communication with God. You know, prayer. Uh, you know, sometimes when you begin to talk about some of these things, it's like, is you alone? No. I believe you're having it better than that talking about right this relationship this fellowship this communication where the lord is speaking he might not be speaking directly to your ear but he has a way of getting your attention find it and he's telling the priesthood i need you to stand in my presence because, look, if you stand in his presence, he talks. He will direct you. He says, I will lead you along the best pathway for your life. I will guide you with my eyes and I will watch over your progress. Because truly, if we are standing in God's presence, people will not come into the temple and go back with their issues unsolved. The Lord will speak. The chair on which they sit will speak. The floor on which they stand will speak. Everything, as soon as they enter into that sanctuary, if the priesthood are really standing in the presence of the Lord, the entire building will be occupied by his presence. And he will minister to people without you even being the immediate what do you call it? Receptacle, vessel. Let me put it that way. Everything. I keep telling people, if you want God to talk to you, he's talking. Everything will talk. Everything will talk. Everything will talk. Sometimes I'm busily working on my computer and all of a sudden, you know, recently, you know, in a place where you don't have passages and stuff like that, you rarely have it. But my computer just went off. I said, what's going on? And I was, I was very alert because I knew that something is missing somewhere. And I turned it on again. The Lord said, go back. And there was this huge mistake there. There was no way, the speed at which I was moving, there was no way I would have been able to get that out. Everything would talk. If you want the Lord to talk to you. And that we are calling on our priesthood. We want to hear from heaven once more. Hezekiah says, stand in his presence. Attend to his service. Be his ministers. His ministers. Swap places. Let him be the landlord. And you, a ministers. A minister is a servant, right? A minister is a servant. He washes feet and pray. He burn incense. We're talking about the tokens of worship. And this discussion is getting quite exciting. Now, what was the spontaneous response of the Levites? They arose. They did not have any quarrel with Hezekiah. They simply arose. And I was just looking at the, the, the various, you know, uh, uh, if you call it, uh, groups, groups of the Levites, 
you know, it's a Mahath, the son of Amasai, and Joel, the son of Azariah, from the sons of the Kohathites, from the sons of Merari, you know, Kish, the son of Abdi, Azariah, the son of Jeha, uh, Lelo, from the Geshonites, Joa, the son of Zima, and Eden, the son of Joa, Joa, <coughs> from the sons of Elizaphan, Sinri and Jael, from the sons of Asaph, that is the musicians, Zechariah and Mataniah, from the sons of Haman, Jael and Shimei, and from the sons of Jeduthun, Shemaiah and Uzael. I'm talking about the various groups and the spontaneity with which they all group themselves. So we are talking about a church with no boundaries, a church with no denominational barriers. Yes, sons of Methodist, sons of Presbyterian, sons of Anglican, sons of Pentecostal, sons of Evangelical, sons of Charismatics, we are getting up spontaneously to respond to this assignment. The denominational barriers will have to be broken if we are looking for true revival. Hallelujah. The Levites arose. Number two, they gathered their brothers, that is fellow Levites, together. They called for more hands to come on the deck. They gathered them. They went around because they have scattered all over, you know, uh, Judah and Israel. They went around. They didn't have the mobile phones. But they did call them. Come, something good is happening. There was a gathering. They rose up. It means they gathered their loins and they were ready for action. Today, I'm sure some people may even take offense at this kind of messages. But that is what the Lord is looking for. In one accord, there is power. On the day of Pentecost, the 120 who had gathered in the upper room were one accord. So the Holy Spirit will come and infuse his strength into them. And change their hearts into that of another man. The change will not come if we are not ready to rise up with spontaneity and break down the domination of Paris. Hallelujah. They gathered their fellow Levites together. It's not about I alone have got it. I'm going to enjoy it alone. Come and let's do this together. It's about us. The selfishness and self-centeredness will have to die if we are going to experience God's glory once more. Then they consecrated themselves. They agreed with the fact that they had been defiled. There is a need for consecration. If we are looking for consecration down into the congregation, we do have to start with the priesthood. He said, when the fish is beginning to rot, it starts from the head. In the same way, when the consecration, we, are, we want to properly preserve the fish, we have to take care of the head. And no humility, we are calling on our priesthood to consecrate themselves. True repentance. When we meet at our churches, uh, what do you call it? Meetings, conferences of pastors. Can it be a time of true repentance? Because you see, when the true repentance starts from there, when we get back home, the work will be very easy. Very easy. The devil will not be able to stand us. And the Lord, according to his word in Psalm 121, 7 and 8, he will keep us from all evil and he will preserve our souls. He will keep our, our, soul, our going out and our coming in from this time forth and forever. He will keep his word. Then he said, they went in to cleanse the house of the Lord. As a king had commanded by the words of the Lord. Did you see what I'm talking about? What I was talking about. The king was talking, but he was speaking the words of the Lord. 
It wasn't a prophet standing by him telling him because every man must have a prophet. That is a message now. Everybody must have a prophet. No, sometimes God speaks through us. The office of the prophet is very important, and yet it is not something that we cannot do without. There was no prophet standing by Hezekiah. In all humility, in all humility, everything that has been said about the prophet, you know, the office of the prophet is as true as it's good. But the word of God must be looked at in totality. Otherwise, it becomes an intimidation. Intimidation. In all humility. <laughs> They had to consecrate themselves. Go into the house of the Lord to clean it. They had to go and do the cleaning. Then you see the verse 16 of 2 Chronicles chapter 29. It was the work of the priest. It was only the priest who could go into the inner part of the house of the Lord. And therefore they alone went in there to clean the inner part of that. Only the priests, not the Levites. So the work was well defined. What the leaders could do, they had to do. What the past priests could do, they had to do. There, there was no, you know, uh, what do you call it? Fighting over the thefts. Everybody knew what they were supposed to be doing. And they did it. Like the man was being called into the inner temple, you know, inner part of the temple, you know, by the... Uh, what do you call the false priests? No, you want me to come there so that you can find an accusation against me because I'm a man like me cannot get in there. I'm not a priest. I can't come. Today we are usurping each other's positions in the name of I'm the senior. Hallelujah. And every unclean thing they found in the temple, they brought out to the courtyard of the Lord's house. Then the Levites received it. After the priests had brought them out from the inner temple, the Levites received them and took them to the Kidon Valley for disposal. Now they began the consecration on the first day of the first month. And on the eighth day of the month, they came to the porch of the Lord. Then for eight days, they consecrated the house of the Lord. And on the 16th day of the month, they finished. Consecration is not one minute part of the service. It is time. We will need to dedicate time to consecrating ourselves as a church. And I believe that as our leaders stand in the presence of the Lord, the Lord will show them how he wants that done. So he can come back into his sanctuary. <laughs> then they went inside to King Ezekiah and said, We have cleansed the entire house, temple of the Lord, the altar of burnt offering, with all of his utensils and the table of showbread with all his utensils. Moreover, we have prepared and consecrated all the utensils which King Ahaz had discarded during his reign in his unfaithfulness. And behold, they are in front of the altar of the Lord. Or pause here and remind ourselves that worship can only begin after consecration, after cleansing, after separation. That is when worship begins. Until then, forget it. The Lord needs you to consecrate your life to him. 
to cleanse your life of every debris and to separate your life unto him because you are looking at worship as a lifestyle. Take your time and read through 2 Chronicles chapter 29 again and see which areas, which idols are still hiding in your life that the Lord wants you to deal with. If you haven't given your life to Christ, we plead with you to seize this opportunity so you can have a fellowship, a renewal of life with God. In fact, life has not begun until you know Jesus. Let your life begin now. You want to do that? Please, in all humility, say this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come just as I am, asking that your blood will wash and cleanse me from every sin, from every iniquity, from every transgression. I confess with my lips that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that he died, and God raised him from the dead for my justification. Lord, please forgive me my sins. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and personal Savior. Help me live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for hearing me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dearly beloved, been reading through Second Chronicles for quite a while. I don't think I ever saw any of this. May the Lord help us and restore true worship in the sanctuary once more and bring us the answer. I think today the Lord is just showing us the answer to our own woes as a nation or as nations. When the temple is cleansed and open, God always opened and cleansed. God will come back, visit us, and pour on us his blessings. May God bless us and keep us till he brings us together again in Jesus' name.